All right, uh, I think uh, so we have uh, 20 minutes time for some uh, discussions and thank you for holding off your questions. And I think we'll just start with uh, you know, free and broad questions and then we we'll see how uh, it develops. So Bill, you want to start? So I guess a question for Dr. Carlson. Um, is the concept of, of uh, constrained resources, is that valid for the concept of the immune system being able to search the space for all possible pathogens or is that? Um... So the, the constraint in that case is really a, a homeostatic constraint that would have to do with either sort of biochemical resources or, or you know, limitations in the size of the cell population. So what, what's happening is you're sort of constantly producing um, naive cells from the bone marrow. They go through a sorting process that, in principle, is removing, um, you know, giving self versus non-self recognition. And those new naive cells are competing with memory cells that are already in the population. Sure. So, so it's, it, there's a constraint in terms of number of cells or we would explode. Cool. And that's yeah. what's applying here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a case of potentially, though, that constraint is so huge compared with what it needs to do to, to do it that it's not really a constraint. I mean, is that, is that a valid? Uh, uh, I mean, I would say it's not necessarily a constraint that's important on short time scales. Okay. So, but, but on the time scales of, of, you know, the organism, it's probably important. Right, okay. our ability to react to sort of new diseases, you know, is something that changes over time, and and I think it's something that comes in late or it comes in when you have to fend off many different threats all at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a follow-up question that's kind of related. I was wondering if you looked with your models at any of the influenza or kind of SARS type things. So this would be a single infection where you have a catastrophic collapse because the immune system overreacts and they think that there's the cyclic um, upregulation of, of immune system. Have you, I, I know that that's been looked at, but I didn't know if it had been modeled in the way that you're looking at. So, so in something like, um, okay, so, so, uh, so why is the flu sometimes as bad as it is? Is that what you Yeah, flu and SARS. So uh -huh. it looks like sometimes the virus gets actually cleared sometimes yeah. by the immune system, right. but the immune system is so overreacting that yeah. it builds on itself until that actually causes the, the pathology. Yeah, I, we haven't looked specifically at that case, but some of the cases that have to do with, with either um, if you can have non-reactive um, chronic infections that remain in the body and, and mess up some of the kinds of things that you would have with naive cell production so that it thinks something related to the original infection is actually a part of self and that can cause a problem or, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of dynamics which what you're talking about has more to do with, with sort of these mechanisms, homeostasis and, and recognition in the system. We haven't looked at specifically at that one, but I'd be very interested in talking to you about it more. Uh, Chris? Uh, this is a question this is a question for Dr. Gore. Um, so I think that you really showed beautifully the, the full bifurcation behavior of the yeast, um, but the, you know, the parameter that was being perturbed in the system was dilution. You know? So that's basically perturbing a number of different parameters all at the same time in that the cells are experiencing a lot of different things differently because of that dilution. Um, so I guess my question is, do you know of ways that you know, the critical parameters that are causing the bifurcation in the first place can be elucidated, or like, is it worth elucidating which parameters should be perturbed in like upstream of these bifurcations? What, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I, what I would say is that uh, the dilution may be the simplest perturbation that you could imagine, uh, but we've, we've, we've been able to measure the bifurcation, whether we increase the dilution rate, the dilution amount, or we decrease the sugar concentration, or we increase the salt concentration. Uh, we get fold bifurcations in all those cases. And I think that's pointing to the kind of robustness of the phenomenon of it being a, a fold bifurcation. And it can, that can happen whether you're turning you know, one parameter in the system or two or three. You know, and, and I think that that's, I would say that that's a, a feature rather than a bug, although different people may view it differently. Thanks. Um, just one other comment. I, I, <clears throat> I think the fold bifurcation is a, kind of a special case of, of, a, of a critical transition. And um, 
uh, a lot has been made of early warning signs, for example, using the full bifurcation as a, as a model. But um, it's, um, it actually is quite special uh, as, a, as, a, as a specific, as a mechanism. Um, and I think that there is a, a much more general uh, way to understand this um, that's independent of the, of, of the structure of a model in that uh, as you approach anything that's, that's unstable, you, the return times go larger, right? Because one over, lambda, one over the real part of the eigenvalue. And, and, um, and if that happens, right, then you get an increased autocorrelation. And if that happens, you get increased variance. So. Yeah, I, I guess I, I wouldn't, you know, you can all, it's hard to know what we mean by special in these cases. I would say uh, there are many situations that seem to be fold bifurcations. I mean, of course, you, a transcritical bifurcation also has, is a zero eigenvalue bifurcation, and then it also displays the same things. Um, but I, I, well, I, I feel like, uh, you know, mathematicians have classified all possible kinds of transitions, and I, um, I don't, I guess some of, you know, I'm, I'm not as convinced that some of those show up in as many different systems as the fold bifurcation. But this, this, people have to go out and make measurements to see, right? It, it was um, interesting, to, there was a meeting in Madrid uh, uh, about three weeks ago um, um, on, uh, it was the ASLA meeting, in fact, and there was a, a, se a session devo devoted to uh, early warning signs. And um, quite a lot of investment has gone into trying to find, uh, to detect early warning signs and the utility of them um, for you know, looking at the lake transitions, for example. Yeah. And uh, what was interesting was that um, it was a very mixed bag that the message that came out. Um, this is the, so these are real systems, not like simple experiments where, that you do in a chemostat. But um, no. it was you know, on the order of uh, like 30% um, early warning signs actually occurred. And, and most of the time, um, they were not able to detect them. But yes. still, the fact that they even got 30%. Yeah, no, right. I think the 30% is a, a vast overestimate because it's totally biased based on the publications sure. and so forth. Yeah, but I think that, I guess my suspicion is that, well, a lot of times in these situations, it's not even a tipping point necessarily. I think people don't know what's going on. And even in the cases that there, they are, a major failure mode is just measurements rather than, uh, I guess I feel like the, the field has spent an awful lot of time thinking about kind of really baroque ways in which they can, these things can fail. But I think that there's this sort of stupid way, which is that it's hard to make measurements of sufficiently high quality that we can, we can see these things. One thing I would say about that, <laughs> my thing is not, it's not on, is it? Or is it? Is it? OK. Um, so <laughs> you just have a louder voice than I do. Um, OK, so, so there are definitely systems that we've come across where you don't really have strong early warnings. But once something happens, the biggest thing is the cascading through multiple systems. So, so I mean, you know, earthquakes, for example. And, and part of that is people are very interested in physical mechanisms for triggering cascading failures through multiple, you know, networks of networks or remote triggering or things like that. But it isn't our insights into how, in terms of predictability are not necessarily coming from from. Um, from the way in which you know you're you're seeing activity prior to some event, because there may be there may be strength issues, there may be nucleation issues, there may be um, stabilization issues, depending on what you're talking about. But once something fails, you know it has the ability to cascade through other parts yeah. of yeah. connected networks. Yeah. Next question, please. Um, Tom Scalag from the Paul Allen Foundation here in Seattle. I wonder, this is really for all of you, could you address the critical importance of the choice of boundaries when choosing a model to describe a system, when any behavior of a system, including its stable state or its approach to a tipping point or a collapse? And you know, I was really struck, George, in your opening talk, you talked about engineered systems. I have my can of Coke here because it's an engineered aluminum can. But you know, eventually it'll corrode, which is a highly nonlinear, complex process. It'll be well described by a manifold and other types of behaviors that we talked about today. So my point is, almost any system, you have to make some choices about boundaries. And, it, and often it's not talked about explicitly, but I think it's really a critical problem in, in certainly modeling omics in biosystems, but also ecosystems or engineered or other designed futures uh, in, on the planet. So boundaries, how you choose them. Yeah, so um, I, I, I actually, I think it's a really good question. And um, I, I would let the data choose the boundaries. So this is, this is the, uh, the very empirical approach. 
So uh, we're basically limited by what we can observe. And so I would basically let our observations decide what, what, what the boundaries of the system are. The observations indicate, you know, I've been able to observe something for three decades, and it says this thing is about seven dimensional, and uh, then that's, that, that's how you determine the boundary, as opposed to writing down a set of equations, and, um, which are really just your hypotheses about how the system works, and then uh, uh, sort of a priori deciding on the boundaries, or, or maybe making some set of measurements that's particular to that set of equations even, is still, you're still bound to, to your initial assumptions that, that those equations are even legitimate. So that's my answer, which is kind of, you know, <laughs> Maybe not the one you want to hear. <laughs> so my answer is that I think this just speaks to the importance of multi-scale modeling and the fact that all these problems, whether they be physics problems or technological problems or biological problems, have, you know, have multiple scales in space and time. Each one has rich dynamical behavior and you know, well worth pursuing you know, for, in its own right. But the important high impact work is going to be things that find ways to connect scales and also um, connect you know, data driven observations with testable hypotheses in the laboratory and, and kind of go back and forth. So the ability for people that are working at these different scales to really interact and communicate with each other is important in every kind of problem that I can think of now that, that people are you know, interested in, whether it be climate or whether it be forest fires or whether it be neuroscience or immune system, they, we all you know, need to be able to think across scales and, and how information from one scale, which information from what, you know, at a given scale is important for, for understanding the next scale. And it's not necessarily an ensemble average. It may be, you know, the, the fracture mechanism or it may be, you know, something else. But, but that's a critical part of, of science today. Right. Maybe I'll just throw in that um, I think that, the, that there's a huge amount of value associated with phenomenological modeling approaches and that uh, we, we have to be able to understand how things connect across scales, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to know everything about the lower scale in order to make even quantitative predictive statements about this higher scale. Of course, some of the information transmits and some doesn't, you know, but I think we have to remember that like, you know, the ideal gas law has been very effective uh, at, as a first order description and then you can have phenomenological corrections to it. But you don't need to know what all 10 to the 20 molecules of gas are doing in order to say some really powerful things about the system. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Couldn't agree with that more. All right, uh, Joseph. Yeah. So um, it, it's very fascinating to hear so, so, so many wonderful talks. So you and George talk about how to um, dis, um, recapture the dynamics. And I think for. Um, different um, physics or economical phenomenon, how to describe it, how to find the early warning um, um, signals. I think Richard talked a, talk a, a little bit approach, use some invent um, method to reverse the process. So because I know for this critical tipping point, the problem when you just by decrease the variable, you will not automatically reverse the state. You always have this hysteresis. So my, my, my question is, what is the most efficient way to reverse this um, um, state transition with tipping point? Is that, it's, it's definitely will not be simply change the variable. Will add new species or change the interactions? What's the most efficient way to reverse uh, state transition? When you, when you mean to reverse, you mean to avoid the reaching the yeah, transition? Like, like, uh, because the, the Earth. reversibility might be not an option. Yeah, like you want to serve the Earth, right? Yeah. What, what's the most efficient way? Yeah, I, I, I guess it's, it's case dependent. I, I, I will say two things. One, one in relation with the previous question about the multi-scale thing, I always kind of worried about every time I heard about multi-scale stuff because you, I'm used to, to address every single problem with a you know, kind of a question-driven uh, approach. And that usually means that you have a scale where you Look at the system. So maybe uh, it's good to know to know a lot about the, the the food web that you have there, but maybe you just need a keystone species that goes beyond the threshold and everything collapses. So the the details of the food web may be not so relevant. And in order to avoid the, the the tipping point, you have to, I guess, you have to apply two things. One is 
um, a knowledge of the system. So I, th I think that is, uh, even for theoreticians, it's important to, to really uh, work with people that really know the system. And uh, I learn a lot with the people that is working on, on drylands, because it's, it's a lot of things you can actually understand that are relevant. And then hope that the, the, the modeling approach that you're using is, is the correct one. And uh, in that respect, there's this lot of efforts in trying to identify warning signals. I mean, I, I think that this is very relevant. But, um, but maybe on the one hand, in some cases, you, you, you are not going to have warning signals. And uh, if you want, you want to really do something about it, we need to actually prevent into going to that state, no matter what, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. But I have a broader question, maybe uh, Gene Stanley and everybody else. So here at ISP, we, we have a dilemma because on the one hand, we have a lot of networks and we talk about network of networks that we heard this morning. If you look around here, the posters and the one, the mural, it's about networks. So that's a high dimensional, but relatively static structure, right? It's more a topological problem. And then we heard a lot of tipping points, which are low dimensional systems, typically deterministic. So how do we unite both? Because we are a complex network, the high dimensional system. And we saw a glimmer of, in the future, in Joe's talk about analyzing uh, transcriptomes in the context of a critical phase transition. So how do we unite these two domains? Network of networks, typically topological problem, and a dynamical system in state space. Why do we have to relate them? I, I don't, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, for me, network of networks is a statement about connectivity, which is very important. How, how things are connected is very, very important. Dynamical system is, is about, I guess, if they're connected, then what are the rules that govern the behavior? But they're connected. Uh, it, it, it's, and, uh, and the connectivity matters immensely, I think. Uh, we all know it does. We know, for example, in phase transitions that the dimension of the system is all important. One dimensional system is totally different than two, and two is totally different than three, and three is totally different than four. Uh, uh, and the only thing that differs is the, is the, is the, the bonds. We make a model, that's nothing else. Uh, uh, even the elementary excitations after about two dimensions are pretty much the same except for factors, but uh, so I, I can't speak too much on dynamic systems without saying bad things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we, so uh, George, do you want to say something on that? High dimensional dynamical systems? Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think uh, uh, wanting to look at networks, and, and I, my, my, early career was involved in sort of bringing formal topology into ecology, actually. Uh, the whole notion of a sim simplicial complex, uh, computing Betty numbers within these simplicial complexes. So this is all sort of mathematics related to static structure, right? And basically what a, what a food web is, for example, is a roadmap. It's a roadmap of all of these potential interactions. But in real, in, in fact, what we really would like is a, is, a, is, a, is a movie of how these interactions are continually changing through time. Um, because that's the reality of, of the system. It's not the average of all the interactions sort of squished as a, as a static picture. But in fact, you have this kind of effervescent web of interactions where the interactions are blinking in and out and changing strength. And this sounds like a, like a totally fanciful ideal, but I, I don't really think it is. Um, I think that it is possible to, um, uh, to, for example, if you have a manifold of some kind and you're looking at how the system is, tr is moving along this manifold, that I think it's possible to look locally um, um, at each location in the manifold and compute what all the interaction strengths are, what all the interaction coefficients are. And, and in fact, <clears throat> there's a paper in review right now that does that. Um, and so it, it's something that, and I think there are probably much better ways of doing it, but, but it is a possibility that you can actually um, compute changing interaction strengths through time. And that's the way, I think that's, um, that's kind of the glue between the network view and, um, and the dynamic view.
Yeah, but that so, is what is being done, right? Yeah. I mean, if you go to sort of think about modern day network science, it's not static networks anymore, just in the same way as, you know, modern day dynamical systems is not fixed at, you know, the sort of place that it maybe was 20 years ago. So I feel like a lot of work, I was excited about your work, the work that we're doing on neuroscience is all about trying to understand time evolving networks and trying to look at structural networks that themselves are changing over time. So these are the scaffolding, whether it be the brain or transportation networks and looking at functional networks that has to do with these most often the measured quantities, the firings or the flow of traffic on these networks. So networks are not static. <laughs> they really, I mean, you know, the historical applications of graph theory to large data sets were coming up with metrics um, for static uh, connectivity or hierarchy or clustering coefficients. But these days, very much and very importantly, the approaches that are being made to many, many different kinds of, of networks, whether communication, all kinds of things, really takes this more dynamical approach. Yeah, yeah but the, uh, so the bifurcation parameter is still low dimensional. We still don't know how to deal with more than two bifurcation parameters. But there's still a challenges ahead, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. yeah. But I, I really think it's easy to make too much of this. I mean, the, the yeast cells that we're working with, you know, they have 6,000 genes, and they're all expressing different amounts at different times. There could be heterogeneity. So it, it's a very high dimensional system. But that doesn't mean that you need to, that it all enters in, right? You know, I think that in many cases, it comes down to a low dimension, a dimensional representation in terms of the things that you actually care about. Is there any more questions? Otherwise, yeah, please. I have a fairly simple question. I just uh, sort of response to Dr. Carlson saying that a lot of our uh, systems have evolved to deal with tipping points. You know, basically, you know, evolution works on you know when uh, forest fire happens, there are seeds that are you know basically uh, fostered by that. So there's an implicit uh, concern about uh, the outcome of a tipping point, but in a lot of cases, the world evolves to that. So how do we? manage, like basically we need a, a, to look at these dynamic systems and assume that maybe there's critical things we need to protect, but that we want actually to allow certain things to, to fail. So like, I, I don't know if that makes sense at all, but uh, do you have a comment on like how, how uh, common are tipping points in the natural world and how important they are for our, the, the dyna our systems to form and what we depend on? I mean, I think, so I think part of this is there's sort of two things. One is, is disturbance ecology, say, the fact that our ecosystems are not isolated objects but have you know, evolved in the presence of variability in the environment and fire and all kinds of disturbances. And after these disturbances, you see you know, this prolific, you know, diver increased diversity, you, know, you see sort of new things happening and it's part of a, a cycle. And then there's this other thing that, that at least what I think of as tipping points is sort of when something's driven away from a natural pattern, perhaps, you know, things that lead to true extinction. So, so I think that, that disturbance and recovery is natural and important and, and perhaps, I don't know, in many cases it's the question of human, you know, human intervention and taking something and, and causing change on a time scale that's very rapid compared to the evolutionary history of a system that is, um, you know, that's a concern. But yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. There are, there are sharp switches built into the dynamics of many systems. Thank you. No more questions? Oh, just two more, and then because cut into you, Greg. So very quick. Oh, well, thank you very much. So I wonder if you can comment, um, uh, do you see a, like a, a contradiction between uh, this worldview that was presented here of this nonlinear systems uh, mostly evolving through transition uh, between multiple states and you know, probably having a property of multi-stability and uh, what is being done in uh, what I would call the big data community where you basically try to establish correlation and I think the, the assumption there being that there is a, a single state of the system that corresponds to a set of variables and you know, having enough data and uh, you know, computer power, we can uh, uh, discern that correlation. So do you think there is like inherent uh, contradiction between these two worldviews? You know? 
So I don't think it has to be, but I think there are people that, that look at it that way. I do think that the hope in all of this, you know, this set of people, I think, maybe I, I don't know if I speak for it, but I think um, is to identify mechanisms that there's a component of sort of big data that isn't as focused on extracting situations when there is a simple thing, you know, understanding what the underlying connectivity is that gives rise to large data. So I think, I think large data is a driver for understanding systems, but it's not, um, you know, algorithm development is, is an approach that's taken often, you know, within computer science separate from um, you know, it isn't like let's find a, you know, a simple model to describe it, but I do think that, that the understanding of mechanisms is really important and that's how you can connect hopefully something that's happening in a large complicated system with a tipping point or a bifurcation in a simpler uh, model. Well, well, I guess my point was that the, uh, the nonlinear system like the ones that were described here today they mostly depend on history because of this uh, hysteresis and multi-stability, whereas most of the kind of big data projects, they do not take history into account. They assume more or less that and for every like, uh, set of variables in the multidimensional space that they handle it, there is a single uh, state of the system and you just need enough uh, power, like a statistical power to find that state. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, um, a mistake myself. Yeah. So um, it's basically that, that kind of approach as you describe it um, really is assuming that things are stable, right. that uh, things are stable and stationary, nothing is changing. Look around you. Is that true? So I rest my case. OK, <laughs> I think uh, I'm sorry we need to, to stop here uh, and uh, take a break and then uh, We'll continue with a session on uh, medicine uh, at uh, 240 sharp. Thank you. And let's thank the speakers again this morning.